um, let's get started with the first talk in the afternoon session here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Stratosphere or Flink. Um, I'm going to explain the name duality in a second. Um, I'm Stefan and I'm, I hope I can tell you a few interesting things in the next minutes. Okay, so um, yeah, as I said, I am, I'm, I'm Stefan. I am currently a yeah, PhD student at, um, here from Berlin actually, University of Technology, last days. So one of the guys who's uh, basically waiting for the professors to find a, a day where they can actually hold the defense can take longer than you might think. Um, I'm one of the people that um, has been involved with the Stratosphere project, um, about which I'm going to talk from the, from the very beginning. Um, so I'm one of the, of the core developers. Okay, and um, as you may have seen on the, on the title slide, actually, it, the, the talk is announced as Stratosphere. On the title slide, I wrote Stratosphere slash Flink. So by the time, actually, we, um, we handed in the talk, this was still the project, um, the project Stratosphere, which started as a project here in the Berlin area. Um, in the meantime, between um, handing in the talk and this event happening, um, Stratosphere has actually been accepted at the Apache Incubator. Um, so it's moving into the Apache Incubator. It's actually taken on a new name because there's already a project called Apache Stratos. So we, um, we voted on a new name and the new name is going to be Flink. So um, I'm going to say Stratosphere for the remainder of the talk because this really describes the outcome of Stratosphere, which is going to be the starting point of the Flink project. But yeah, you can think of Stratosphere and Flink being synonyms for the sake of this talk. And um, courtesy of Alan Friedman is the first draft of the of the mascot of um, of the Flink project. So for those of you who are not German speakers, um, Flink is actually a it's a German word and means um, agile, nimble. So that's why we have the, uh, the squirrel as a, as a mascot. Okay, so much for the introduction. So whenever I say stratosphere, you can just in your head think flink as well. Okay, so what is, what is stratosphere all about? It's, um, it's, a f it's a fairly new open source project as such. So um, a few of you may have heard about it, a few of you may not. Um, to sum it up in a few words, it's, a, um, it's an analytics platform. So it's in the, in the space of systems like Hadoop and Apache Spark. It is, um, it is not built on top of Hadoop and on top of Spark. So it's its, its own system, it's its own stack. It, um, it runs very nicely on top of HDFS and Yarn. So it integrates um, very well with the, uh, with the Hadoop stack. And um, it has its um, it has its focus on um, on a variety of use cases and uh, especially on on ease of programming, providing high level abstractions for um, for programmers. Um, to give you a little idea where this project is standing, it's um, it started quite a while ago as a as a research project here in the Berlin area, shared between um, different universities. Um, when the when the research project was over. Um, we thought that the result was actually kind of nice and um, we got very good feedback on it, so we, we kind of pushed it um, to become an open source project. So that's where it is right now. It's, um, it is, at this moment, the, uh, the code base that you can get is still hosted on GitHub. It's, um, it's an open source project there. It is, as I said, moving to the Apache Software Foundation under the name Flink. We are in the, um, in the fifth release, so fifth release is actually coming, coming out right about now. There's the, the second release candidate is, I think, online since the weekend. And um, we began um, pushing it into the open source about half a year ago, and um, it has actually gotten quite a bit of adoption, adoption right now. So we have a total of 38 contributors already, not all of them from Berlin, actually. So. Um, we also have people working on, um, on projects related to Stratosphere in various places. And um, yeah, we also, um, we're seeing first companies trying it out for, um, for applications. Okay, so much um, as the background. So what is, what is Stratosphere really um, to you as somebody who wants to try it out? Um, so what is Stratosphere and why would actually the ecosystem need something else than Hadoop and Spark and there's so many other systems, Drill and... Um, so when we started Stratosphere, we thought there are kind of these two spaces. There's the, the MapReduce 
style space um, with projects, of course, like Hadoop, MapReduce, and um, yeah, Spark getting more and more traction, also fitting, in my opinion, more in that space. And there's the, um, there's the area of, of, of databases. Um, initially, mostly relational databases, but also databases that go beyond that, like um, Apache Drill. And there's, there's a spectrum between those, um, between those different types of technologies. Um, they, they each have their very individual strength. So the, the MapReduce space um, has focused heavily on scalability, on user-defined functions as first-class citizens, uh, very complex data types, um, all of that. The database area has focused um, uh, since the 60s or 70s, actually, on uh, very much on declarativity. So you, you write a, a very concise query, you delegate a lot of, um, of the decisions to the system, how, how should it be executed. Um, it comes with this optimizer component. It has, for what it does, a fairly efficient runtime. And we kind of thought there's, um, there's a nice sweet spot between those two systems where you can combine some of the characteristics. And this is where Stratosphere actually sits. It sits between the um, MetroGeo Star technologies and the database technologies. And it adds also its very own twist to it. So um, we've added functionality, especially for iterative algorithms, which are very important if you're looking into applications like machine learning, graph analysis. Um, it is fairly complex um, data flow programs. And it's adding, it's adding um, the, a bit of that declarativity, that magic sauce that is known from databases um, for non-relational um, kind of programs. So this is what it, what it looks like if you look at it from 20,000 feet or so. It's, um, yeah, it's a stack. It sits on top of, a, um, of, of various storage and um, cluster management solutions. Um, the, the storage being Satisfy itself does not store data, so it, it reads files, structured files, unstructured files. It draws data from databases um, in various formats, so local files, HDFS, cloud file systems. Um, it can be deployed onto clusters using uh, frameworks like Yarn, or you can directly install it on the bare metal. And on top of that sit, um, sits Stratosphere's runtime optimizer and a, um, a series of APIs. And I think this picture kind of um, tells quite a bit about the system, especially the, um, this very prominent component here, which is, um, which is very much inspired by the architecture of relational databases. So Stratosphere has a, has a common runtime and a common optimizer for multiple programming APIs. They're record-oriented programming APIs in Java and Scala, graph-oriented APIs, um, um, a scripting language um, for uh, for JSON language. All of these go through the same optimizer at the same runtime, and there you can um, some of them you can actually even mix and match in a, in a very nice way. So what 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 makes Stratosphere kind of unique in that in that space of big data technology? There, um, I'll I'll talk about um, the individual points later in more detail, but I think you can sum it up in, in basically four, four broad categories. So very strong focus is on easy-to-use developer APIs in different languages. As I said, uh, Java Scala graphs are already there. There's Python and SQL under development. I think actually the Python API is in beta status right now. Um, with these easy-to-use developer APIs, kind of hand-in-hand -hand comes um, automatic optimization. So that is something that comes more from the space of the relational databases. Um, what, what Stratosphere does, it, it, it implements an optimizer that is inspired, although not the same as an optimizer in relational databases. So you can write programs and not worry about many of the individual low-level decisions that you need to, need to make um, when you write something, for example, in Hadoop or in Spark. And just delegate it to the system and say, okay, figure that out for me. Um, it comes with its own runtime, so it's not sitting on MapReduce, a runtime that is uh, running computation in memory as far as possible. It's going out of core when necessary. It, um, that is fairly unique as well, I think. Streams data between operations, even though it has a batch API on top of it. So that might sound um, a little weird initially, but it does actually make sense for uh, a lot of operations because it implies that if you have multiple steps after another, you can actually produce pretty big intermediate results, which you never have to materialize in store. And um, yeah, I mentioned that earlier. There's, there's uh, very deep support for iterative algorithms. Um, they're very deeply embedded both in the APIs and in the runtime. 
And I'm going to show you a few examples later of uh, what that actually means to the programmer and um, to executing iterative algorithms. OK, so from the high-level um, view of the system, what does it uh, look like if you actually write your first example program? Um, so here's the, here's the infamous word count, which is kind of the, I don't know, it's kind of the hello world, I think, of the, uh, of the parallel analytics space. So this is what it looks like in, um, in Stratosphere's Java API. It's, um, the, the APIs, both in Java and Scala, are, are centered around data sets that you create. Um, and on which you apply um, yeah, transformations functions like um, mapping over them, grouping, aggregating, and so on. You write, um, you write your, these transformations just as Java functions, and unlike, unlike Hadoop, you can really use, you can use just plain Java objects, the basic types. You can also use your own, your own classes and so on. There's, a, there's kind of a mixture of, of analysis of the types, reflection analysis, and uh, general purpose utilization going on to make that work. Okay, so this is for the um, this is for the Java API. I think this gives you a rough impression of, of what it looks like. Yeah, data sets, your types, um, tuples are kind of built in as a special concept. In the Hadoop world, everything is around key value pairs, but we thought for a more um, more complicated program, this actually gets a little. This gets a little ugly in, um, after a while, and for those of you who are Scala programmers, they'll actually know this tuple concept. It's, um, it's fairly powerful. So um, in Scala, of course, everything looks even a little more beautiful. If, if you're a fan of Scala, this is the same program. Um, it's not 100% the same, but roughly the same program written in Scala, so it's the same thing. You start with a, with a data set created from a text file, transform it here with an operation that uh, splits the lines, um, in this case, you just group by the entire um, the entire record. So this is what this lambda here expresses. Given that you get a word, just group on the entire word, and then and then count however it occurs. So far, so good. That should look for those of you who have looked into frameworks like let's say Spark or Crunch or so, um, somewhat familiar. Um, the the whole APIs are designed around a, um, a rich set of, of operators. So the runtime, if you wish, knows, um, knows a few operators. Map, reduce, join, co-group, union, cross, iterate, and iterate delta. Um, I think the, the first six should be, you should recognize probably from if you've worked with cascading or so before, or, or actually Spark. Iterate and iterate delta might seem a little special, and I'm going to talk uh, about them in a bit. Um, this is what kind of the, the core of the system knows. In the APIs, there's a lot of derived operators as well. Filtering, flat mapping, project, aggregating, duplicate elimination, several forms of joins, and also derived operators, which are kind of compositions of other operators. For example, um, vertex-centric graph computations, which are a combination of iterations and co-group and um, joins. So what what does the system do internally once you write such a program? So it's not breaking it down into a series of MapReduce jobs. It's not just saying, OK, let me execute one step, materialize the result, let me execute the other step, the next step. What it's really doing is it's, um, it's taking the entire program, um, constructing a, a data flow graph out of it. So this operation, streaming data from here and streaming it into the reduce operation, the reduce operation gathering it for hashing, sorting, and streaming it into the join. And um, so this is, this is really a pipeline, uh, a data flow, with multiple operators possibly executing at the same time. That is online if you execute the program. And it has the ability to also take, take data from, um, from a later step and in a controlled fashion feed it back to an earlier stage, um, thereby closing a loop and enabling um, to do iterative or recursive computations. Okay, um, so much as a, as a, as a teaser from, um, from that level. Let's, let's actually walk through some cases where, um, where, the, where what we added to the system in terms of um, optimization and, um, and ease of use actually becomes a little more, a little more graspable. So um, here's a variant that, that, um, that runs a, um, a program, roughly sketched by this um, but this, yeah, but this uh, abstract algebra tree here—it's a—it's a 
two joints between a large and a medium-sized table with a small table and an aggregation afterwards. Something that, that does occur as, I don't know, possibly intermediate steps in algorithm or pre-processing steps. So in, what you would do in Stratosphere is you would um, you'd write the program starting to read the data in, in this case from CSV files, which, which would parse the data into, into some tuple data structure. And then, then you would do two joins between the large and the medium table. Um, the syntax here, if you have tuple data, you can just express, okay, which fields of the tuple to use. If you have, don't have tuple data, you can throw in a lambda that says, okay, here's how you get actually the key from the data type. So you join these two tables run a, um, and run a, a group by an aggregation over it in the end, and then you submit it to the system. And what does the system do with it? There, for those of you who have actually spent some time with, um, with Hadoop and Hive, um, they might know that there, especially for joins, uh, there are several ways to execute them. So um, in, I think in Hive they call them reduce side join or map side join. They call them sort join and hash join and so on. And you can build a lot of combinations to execute these, to execute these um, different joins with different algorithms, some of which are good in one situation and some of which are good in another situation. So all in all, if you take this program and you, you tell the programmer, okay, you need to figure out now what exactly is the way to execute the first join and the second join. They're going to, there are going to be quite a few combinations. And actually figuring that out is not, it's not uncrucial because it really makes difference in the execution times in orders of magnitudes. So below here um, is a list of the strategies that Stratosphere knows internally. So partition join, which is kind of close to the reduced side join versus replicated joins, which is close to the map side join, sorting and hashing algorithms underneath. And trying to um, trying to come up with a good way there is something that um, that the system can can here do for you. So you submit this job to the optimizer, and what the optimizer does is it actually looks at the it looks at the sizes of the of the data that go into the operations. It makes an estimate how this operation um, behaves, how it changes the data, what the data sizes is that go into the successive operations. It's going to look holistically on the plan and going to see, okay, if I do this here, can I probably possibly reuse something here? So can I collapse these operations into one operation? Can I maybe do something here that ca I can reuse later at that point? So it's going to take this yeah, holistic look at the plan and trying to optimize it. So here an example. One way that, um, that you could do it is say, okay, take the first join here and make this, a, make this a partitioned hash join, which is, I don't think it's something that you can actually do in MapReduce. It's closer to the reduce side join than to the map side join, but it's not really it. Um, the second join could be a, what does it do? Broadcast hash join here. And that gives you a very interesting, um, a very interesting setup because it allows you, um, if you if you look here, the grouping field that you use, use at this position is kind of this, is the same field that you use here for joining. So given that you did something like partitioning on this field here, um, broadcasting um, on the other side, and for this join, you can simply reuse it. So it means that it, the that Stratosphere can come up with a way of executing this program. That, that this aggregation, which is normally a reducer, comes basically for free. So you can you pay you pay one one join, you pay a map side join here, and you get the successive aggregation kind of for free. This is how it um, stitches together the execution plans. So this is uh, this is kind of the value you get out of an optimizer um, being added between the APIs and the runtime. Okay, now that we've um, that we've written a program, that we've looked at, um, okay, what can actually happen in terms of, uh, of optimization? How do we execute it? And um, there, there are different ways of doing that. So I guess from the, from the Hadoop space, the, the natural thing would be, um, yeah, package it, package it into a jar file, um, copy it into your cluster and invoke the, invoke the script that executes the, executes the program. So that actually, uh, you can do the same thing here. Um, something that's actually even more comfortable in, um, in my opinion is saying, okay, I'm just defining the program to work on a remote environment. So I'm creating an environment that points at the cluster where it's supposed to be executed. Um, I'm going to invoke it and it will be, uh, the program will be serialized and thrown onto the cluster via an RPC call. And if you just 
you know, if you're writing the program and you're not absolutely sure you've gotten it right the first time or you want to play around a little bit, you can also just define a local environment and execute it from, from anywhere in your IDE. You can actually do this embedded within other programs. So you, you have a regular Java program, you write something, then you embed a part of, Java, of a stratosphere program, say, okay, execute this locally embedded in this JVM, and then you continue with the, with the other parts of the program. So depending on how you configure it, it will run single-threaded or multi-threaded. All right. Um, let me show you two slides about the runtime. I personally can talk about the runtime um, probably for two hours alone because uh, this is my favorite part. But um, let me try and, um, and give you just a just a quick overview of uh, of what it looks like. So from from a high level, the runtime of Satisfire and Hadoop don't look don't look too different. You have um, you have a master to which you submit jobs. The master does resource management, scheduling. And you have, the, you have the task managers which do the actual work. Ideally, you co-locate them with data nodes of the distributed file system to get local reads, but you don't have to. And um, yeah, the, the master pushes out work to the workers. The workers communicate with each other to exchange intermediate results. In, in, the, in the details, this works a little different than, than it does, for example, in, in Hadoop or also in Spark. Um, as I said earlier, the um, the, the workers to actually do uh, to actually do a streaming exchange of data, and also all operations are written such that they 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 um, allocate a lot of memory when they start up. They're trying to fill it up as much as possible. Um, once they hit um, once they hit the level that they've used it up, the operations are written such that they gradually move parts of the computation to disk. So this is also something that is, if you wish, more inherited from the database systems and the way these algorithms are implemented. Um, most of them have a characteristic that they, they have a very gradual um, way of going to disk. So if you get this one record that actually makes you go beyond the capacity of your memory, it's not all of a sudden that everything goes to disk, but the first parts go to disk only. OK, and there's, um, there's another. Um, Another um, aspect to it that makes it a bit different than, than most of the systems that are around there. So we've placed kind of an, an, an emphasis on, um, on robustness here, which means that we don't, we don't gather, let's say, if you have an intermediate result, you gather data for sorting or for a hash table, or you just you want to cache the data. Uh, in memory, we don't gather the the objects that you work on, even though you write that you're working on objects. But what you actually do is we gather binary representations of the um, of the data. That is somewhat similar in the way that um, the that Hadoop does it, um, which uh, gathers the serialized data. Although we do it a little differently. So, um, Stratosphere has a chunk of of memory pages, which are, if you wish, just byte arrays of 64k size, in in which it gathers the data, but it um, it does so in a fairly transparent way. So, if you if you use a class, um, for example, a tuple, um, we know very specifically actually how the data looks like, how the data is laid out once you create a binary representation. Um, what this allows you to do is um, it allows you to write certain algorithms of the runtime to to work directly on this binary data. So you don't have to um, to go to the um, to the binary data, turn it back into an object to whatever operation you want on the object, for example, comparing them if you want to sort them. But a lot of, the, um, of these operations can actually happen directly on the, on the binary data. Um, and that goes beyond, let's say, key value pairs or so, also for, for more complicated structures that you get from longer tuples on nested objects. All right. Um, let me tell you a little bit. OK, I'm, I know I'm actually moving kind of fast through it, so if you have questions. Um, I'll be happy to uh, to spend some time in the end, actually going also back to the individual sections and answering questions there. Okay, um, let me spend a few minutes on iterative algorithms because that is um, that is something where uh, where we added we added quite a bit of functionality, also in a way that I think is quite different from what most systems out there do. So iterative algorithms are kind of an interesting class of algorithms. They are very important for um, for a lot of uh, a lot of applications, for a lot of algorithms from the fields of uh, clustering, optimization, uh, graph graph analysis, graph processing. What they what they really do is they um, they do multiple passes over the data. 
Um, most of the time, these algorithms start out with, with a set of parameters that is somewhat randomly initialized, or, or it's, the, it's the state of, let's say, um, the previous day or so. And what you then do is you go multiple times over your, uh, over your data to analyze, and each time you refine the parameters a little bit, you go over them the next time, refine them a little bit more until you've kind of reached a conversion state, and then you've, you've trained your classifier, you've found your clustering. So the, the way that, is, that this is most often done is um, by implementing, the, implementing that functionality that makes one pass over the data and really just invoking it a lot of times, which seems like the natural thing to do. So Hadoop, in Hadoop you would say, okay, I have my data here in the distributed file system. I call this the step function, which does, which does one computation of this algorithm. The result is again going to the distributed file system, so I'm going to do that again from distributed file system to distributed file system, on and on and on. It works, but you pay kind of a kind of a high overhead for always doing the full amount of work. So the Apache Spark project does this in a in a way that's a bit cleverer by saying, okay, let's just do the let's just do the computation from RAM to RAM. So we read from disk the first time, and um, always afterwards we just read from RAM. Um, this gives you also the ability that if you have something that doesn't change between iterations, you can specifically say, okay, pin me that into the main memory and um, yeah, reuse it. Stratosphere does it a bit different. Um, what, what Stratosphere does is once you bring up an iterative algorithm, you really bring up one instance of this data flow that does the, the computation. So if the, if, the, um, if the computation consists here of a map, reduce, join, join, then instead of having it once and then another time afterwards and another time afterwards, you really bring it up once and just um, close a, a data flow uh, edge back from the last operation to the first operation. So in that sense, it's not, um, it's not a loop that you kind of roll out. It's really a closed loop, if you wish. And um, that is... It has, um, it has the advantage that, that you can actually share part of the computation across multiple steps. So assume that, that there is some, let's say, some auxiliary um, data set that you want to initialize inside this operator once, uh, once, you, um, once you start the computation. This can be, let's say, a, a library with another classifier that you, you, know, you load and you bring it up and then you invoke this function. Instead of doing this every time while you unroll it, you can you really do this once and the data just pipes through the operator multiple times. It doesn't do that so in an uncontrolled fashion, so there's a clear synchronization of super steps between that. But this is really, you know, just lightweight coordination between the operators. There's no, it's really deployed into the cluster and um, initialized only once. Um, another thing, Again, coming back to this um, to this optimizer that um, that Stratosphere does is it um, it it also can, it also looks at this um, at this loop the way you specify it and figures out okay where's where's data loop invariant so what happens let's say once across all loops what can I cache uh, in order to say okay let me get back at this result in every in every every time I feed back the data again instead of recomputing it. So it's um, it's placing such caches automatically. It's um, it's looking at the data flow and trying to push some part of the computation out of the loop if possible. So to do it before the entire loop starts. And um, yeah, if it has actually first class support for maintaining state across iterations, which it can um, where it can actually use a uh, an index to um, to access it. So this is a screenshot actually from the um, from the optimizer's visualization tool where you can have a look at. Um, at the way Stratosphere executes programs. Okay, and um, what that allows us to do if we have a loop that is so tightly integrated into the runtime, you can actually mix and match certain paradigms. So here's an example program that, um, that starts. It starts with an execution environment. It creates two data sets here for vertex IDs, for edges. It runs a regular map style function as a pre-processing step, and then it invokes a vertex-centric iteration. So you can actually embed different paradigms even in, in the program. So you start record-oriented, you switch to vertex-oriented. You can, if you wish, switch back to record-oriented later, switch back to vertex-oriented for another time um, if you want. So 
Um, this here is something that is, um, for those of you who know Apache Giraffe, it's an interface that's very similar to it. It's, um, you describe a graph computation by, by looking at the graph from the perspective of a vertex and saying, okay, I'm receiving some messages from my neighbors and I'm sending messages to my neighbors. So this is, this is really that thing just embedded into, into an, um, or encapsulated in an operator that you can embed in this, in this API. And um, the ability to, to maintain state across multiple steps of the iteration is actually something that is really powerful if you use it. So for many of these machine learning algorithms, you have, a, you have this characteristic that not all of these parameters that you, that you refine in terms of the computation actually needs as much computation. There are some parameters which converge very fast and some of them converge very slow. So it, it is a good thing to say, okay, once a parameter is converged, I'm actually keeping it out of the loop. So I'm doing the loop only on, on whatever parameters are still changing. And because I can really keep them, let's say, in the operator, put to the side, you can, you can keep them around without computing on them. And this, if you implement this correctly, then the, this can get your runtime down um, by very much. Okay, let me, let me skip over those slides and just give you a... Um, uh, a rough roadmap of where the system is going, and if I have time, actually a two-minute demo in the end. So what we're, um, what I've shown you now is kind of the the end of the Stratosphere project. So where the Flink project is going right now is, um, yeah, of course, it's moving to Apache. So we're um, we're releasing the latest uh, pre-Apache version 0.5 um, now. You can try out the release candidates if you want. So one of the next things we're going to add is mid-query fault tolerance. That is something we didn't take from the research project into the open source yet. Um, support for interactive queries and cross-query caching. In our design, those two are actually very closely related. So um, this is a common effort. Um, we've started looking into TES. So TES is a, um, is a runtime that is um, developed by, mainly by the Hive community, I would say. Um, it's, the, it's the new runtime under the, under the latest version of Hive, but it is actually a general data flow runtime. So um, we're actually seeing how Stratosphere as, let's say, the APIs and the optimizer can be integrated with, uh, with TES and um, adding it as an alternative execution engine to our own, to our own execution engine. Because um, the good thing is Hortonworks is putting um, a lot into TES and making sure it runs on 10,000 nodes. That is honestly beyond what we have done yet, the 10,000 nodes. So it makes sense to, um, to say if we, uh, we, have, um, we have strong higher level layers and um, and find kind of an orthogonal match on the lower uh, on the lower layers. Um, the there's probably um, uh, I'm not sure if there's a talk about that for those of you from Berlin. The last recommender get together on Thursday actually introduced um, the new Mahout Scala DSL for linear algebra operations. Um, they're running it currently on Spark. What we're doing is we're also adding operations underneath and trying to integrate Mahout with Stratosphere. So. Um, that you can that you can actually run the linear algebra computations from out on stratosphere and um, there's there's a group in um, in Budapest that's working on streaming so I mentioned that the runtime the lower levels actually have streaming like computation um, so what we're trying to do is actually surface them in in a, in a high level in a higher level API some some storm like capabilities um, the nice thing about that is once you actually have this in the same system, you can kind of build a lambda architecture kind of thing without wiring together, let's say, Hadoop and Storm. You can really build it in one end-to-end -end integrated system where you get, you get time-safe and efficient interchange of data types and everything. Yeah, and a last thing that I want to mention on the roadmap is that we're, we're trying to um, actually improve the, the upper layer APIs to go more to to a logical uh, way of, of specifying queries. So what, what that can give you is, um, is, is shown here. There's only a prototype for that. It's not part of the release right now. Um, this is, it's the same, same word count example. Instead of working on tuples, um, it works on a, on a very simple class defined here um, with two fields, uh, a word and a count field. And instead of uh, writing functions that, um, that, that uh, really access these fields or modify these fields, um, you, can, you can simply drop in the names of the fields. You say group by the word, um, aggregate, or sum up the count field. So in order to, to ease the interchange, uh, the interplay between, um, between objects and, and the API. 
Okay, and with that, uh, I'd like to conclude the talk. <laughs> Our motto was Big Data Looks Tiny from Satisfy. We're still looking for a good, uh, a good slogan for Flink, so if anybody has any suggestions, please drop us a note on the mailing list. Um, you can find a lot of the resources um, that, um, that show how to get started, that um, give you an idea of what the, what the APIs look like and so on at stratosphere.eu or on GitHub, Stratosphere, Stratosphere. And um, yeah, if you're interested in release announcement, uh, news and so on, follow us on Twitter. Thanks. So we have a few minutes for questions or a demo. I'll actually leave that up to you, whatever you prefer. So it seems questions, huh? Okay. Um, hello. Um, I had a bunch of questions, uh, mostly about uh, comparison with Spark, but uh, you mostly answered uh, them. Um, unfortunately, I only learned about Stratosphere like a um, few weeks ago, uh, whereas Spark was, uh, we are working with it um, one year ago. So we have more experience. Um, do you consider uh, Stratosphere or Flink to be uh, production usable or? To, to consider what? Uh, is it production ready? Com is comparing it to Spark because uh, apparently both projects are fairly similar. There will okay. be a streaming uh, with uh, Stratosphere 2. The, the most Striking difference, uh, well, advantage I, I would see for Stratosphere is the, um, the the way to degrade to disk. With Spark, sometimes you have uh, out of memory; it's um, uh, much harder to tune. Sometimes works, sometimes not. Yeah. Okay. So there was a bunch of questions. I think the main the main point was the comparison with with Spark. What are the main advantages? Is it as production ready and so on? So. Um, the, the projects have been going on similarly long. I think our open source effort started quite a bit later, only half a year ago. Um, is it production ready? Um, I think you'd have to you have to try it out. Uh, the the parts that we've shown here, we've actually we've tested them. There are some people that are using it. I think none of them has have pro uh, deployed it into production pipeline. Most of that is, let's say, um, let's say clusters for you know data exploration and so on. Um, that it does work, that much I can say. The, the streaming parts are, they're currently under development, so everything, what I'm saying right now is about the batch parts, the stuff that I talked here, not about the roadmap part. So I would say it's in a shape that you can try it out, definitely. Um, also try it out and you should be able to, to really do something with it, not spend debugging your entire afternoon. Um, the, the most striking differences, if you would compare it to Spark, are, yes, so there's, there's the, an, an optimizer, so we're putting a lot of effort on making the higher level API simpler. The optimizer, also the, in the way the roadmap shows that uh, we try to do the, the higher level APIs in a, in a more logical and physical way. Um, the way that you do iterations in a, in a stateful manner, so you, you can actually run the same operators for multiple, for multiple loops. You can, um, Stratosphere bundles a lot of, uh, of operators into the same JVM, so you can share data structures across there. So if you have, let's say, libraries or cache data or so that you share across op uh, operators because you run multiple of them together, um, that can give you definitely an, an advantage here. And um, yeah, the, the system has been designed from the start to be actually a system that can go nicely out of course. So, um, except for one operator, which is the um, which is the iteration state index, which is an operator that which is I would say one of the really of the most advanced features in there. Except for that one, all of them are actually architected in a in a in a fairly clean way of going to disk. So except for that one, I don't think any of them crashes if you run out of memory and also without tuning. So that that should work. If you find it otherwise, please let us know and we'll fix it. Yeah, uh, thank thank you for the, the answers. Um, a bit more uh, for Spark, it's very easy to test with the the shell, the, the command line uh, interface, and um, I, I guess uh, yeah, you talked about uh, Stratosphere. Uh, we'll have that uh, in the near future, right? Yes. So the um, something like the like the com like an interactive way of of doing the. Um, let me go back to the to um, to the roadmap. 
an, an interactive way of, com, um, of writing programs is on the way. I mean, still, you can already fairly easily use it um, with this, with the local environments and just executing, the, ex executing them locally. So let me see if we can actually see that here. So if you see a program here in, um, in Stratosphere, you can, you can just uh, generate data sets by saying, okay, um, uh, just say, okay, environment, create a data set from some elements that I throw in. I just give a local collection. It's going to move that collection into the cluster and use as a data set. You can, you can say just, okay, whatever, print the result here or uh, gather it back in a, in a collection output format and so on and directly test against it and then execute it locally. So all of that you can just, you can, can hit run and, and, and locally test it. And then you can say, okay, okay, let's change the environment, point it to the cluster and move it into the cluster instead. So run it locally and then point it to some other place and run it in the cluster. So it's, um, it is true there are some cases where the interactive shell makes it easier. It's going to come. But I think it's already fairly easy to use, to be honest, for, yeah. for quite a few algorithms. So question on... Uh, uh, about how you handle the the uh, the fault tolerance. How 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 do you work with fault tolerance? In again, in Spark, you have this concept of RDD. Yeah. Do you have something similar, or is it something else? Okay, let's go to this slide here, or maybe even to to that one. Okay, so. As I said, fault tolerance is actually coming up. Um, the university project had fault tolerance, which we decided not to move into the open source because we weren't confident enough that it was robust. So we're kind of reworking this and adding it to the open source. And um, the way that the way that it works is, if you wish, it's not so different from RDDs because um, the data flows that that Stratosphere constructs kind of between between the data flow and a lineage, it's kind of the same thing. The, uh, the only difference in the, between the systems is that um, Spark would execute, let's say, these two together, then that one, then that one, and then that one. Whereas Stratosphere may actually execute them at the same time. So um, if one of those fails, you can, you can do the same trick. You can backtrack to the graph and say, okay, where's the latest point where I actually materialized my results? The difference here is that once a later operator that you, let's say, stream the data to has already been started, you might actually have to tell that operator, okay, reset and uh, start from the start from the beginning. The later operators, because they may have consumed some data that is that is invalid. Then once you restart predecessors or so, that's really the I'd say the only big difference. Other than that, the two concepts kind of kind of the same. Okay, we have one last question here. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, you mentioned that the optimizer. Uh, decides what kind of joints to use in what order to run, sometimes based on the size of the data. Yeah. Um, is there uh, some trick that you use this to, to find out what the size of the data is beforehand? Yeah, um, good question. There actually is. So if, um, if you would look at this program, the, um, the input formats that, that, that read the data here, in this case, it's the CSV input formats, input formats being very similar to the Hadoop input formats, um, they have actually the ability to say, OK, um, give me some statistics over the data and the default input formats um, implement typically something something fairly lightweight you know connecting to the uh, to the data node and or to the um, to the name node um, uh, summing up sizes of the files gathering a lightweight sample of of let's say 50 lines or so and figuring out the average length of the line so so um, to figure out how many how many rows are actually going to be in that file roughly so that's what it that's what it does to to get an, an idea of what the the characteristics of these uh, initial data sets are. Um, once you actually go into um, into um, a later operator, there are some there's some um, like in database systems some some assumptions uh, how these operators behave that give you um, that give you a rough estimate of what the data says afterwards is. So these can actually be off. They they are often off by quite a bit, but in many cases, that's not totally bad because they have to give you like a rough book or ballpark. It's going to be a really huge one. Is it going to be a very small one and so on? So as long as that works, um, that is fine. What um, what we're actually doing in the are going to do in the future um, in order to improve this is once you have this, let's say the interactive mode of, of running queries, the optimizer can actually submit the queries also interactively. So what you can do is you can submit the first join and have a look at the first data it produces before you actually say, okay, I really, I'm, I'm executing the second join now. So that gives you a, a moment to reconsider before 
before executing later parts of the join. And also, you can say join and say, system, please decide for me which way to go. But if you say, okay, I'm actually very, um, very confident, I know how to do this correctly, and I'd rather not take chances with the system, then just say join with large, or join with tiny, or join symmetric or so, and you will tell it exactly how to do it. Thank you very much. I think we have to give the audience a chance to go to the other talks. Thank you, Stefan. All right. <laughs>